Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am very, very honored to have the opportunity to address you today. In my professional life, in many places, uh, I have had the privilege of working with many scientists from Arab countries and with Arab countries. And, uh, and every one of those experiences was an extraordinarily positive experience. So I am very honored to have a chance to talk to all of you. And hopefully this will be the starting point uh, of further conversations and perhaps collaborations to make sure that we can do that at your convenience. As you see in my first slide, I'm giving you my email addresses. I will also show them in my very last slide so that if you miss the opportunity now, you can perhaps take a picture later on. Now I have several email addresses because I have several affiliations right now and I wanna make sure that I don't disrespect anybody, but they all work just as well. So feel free to write me at your convenience and I'd be delighted to be at your service. So the topic I will address today is the topic of translational medicine. And I will define what it is more precisely in a moment. But uh, roughly speaking, it is the process that takes a scientific product, a scientific idea, a scientific discovery, and brings it um, in hospitals, in medical offices, in pharmacies, in places where they can be used by people that need them, by patients that need them. I'll call, I've called this Lost in Translation, of course, uh, the, with a takeoff from a famous movie, simply because of the fact that, as you will find out, very tragically, the vast, vast, vast majority of scientific discoveries that could help people that need help, people that have terminal diseases or chronic diseases that they have to be afflicted by for their own lives, many discoveries, the vast majority of those discoveries never make it. And even those that make it can only be used by very few people and it takes way too long and much too much money. So I think it is an extraordinary priority for the whole world. And I think now that we are in the COVID-19 era, it becomes very apparent to everybody, and it should be, that focusing on ways to translate science into medical products most efficiently is an ethical priority, is an ethical mandate for the whole world together to address. I was asked, like all the other speakers, to give a brief self-introduction. Please accept my apologies if I do that and it gets a bit boring. So right now, I am a professor of pharmaceutical sciences and affiliate professor of pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm also a professor of business and a member of the board at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. I'm what you call a scientist entrepreneur, so I've started many companies, I've been working, and I'll tell you a few of the stories. I'm currently on the board of Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals, which is a NASDAQ-traded, or Wall Street-traded company. It's headquartered in Pasadena, California. That company does siRNA therapeutics, a special type of gene therapy, silencing genes. I've been, I'm the senior most member of the board. I started being on the board about 12 years ago, the company, and I've seen the process of translation within that company take ideas from the very fundamental level of scientific discovery into multiple medical products that are in the clinic right now against several diseases, very, very tragic diseases with huge prevalence worldwide. And I've seen the value of the company go on NASDAQ from tens of millions to several billions, which means creating jobs and wealth at the same time and opportunities for many, many people, which is a huge side benefit, of course, of the translational process. I am also currently on the board of a company that I've started. It's called Briette Pharmaceuticals. It has operations in Houston and in London. And to make sure that I clarify which of these has contributed to the different things I'm going to be talking about? I've used their templates, templates of current and prior uh, positions that I've held, indicate where the work was done. So in terms of my uh, training and background, I trained in mathematics, I trained in engineering, 
I went to medical school in my 40s when I was already a professor of engineering and a professor of medicine, but not on the clinical side. I never became a medical doctor. And I got some training in business because of some of my leadership positions, uh, sometimes induced the various institutions that I serve to send me for further training. So I've done my business training in places such as Harvard and uh, the University of Pennsylvania. So uh, in my life, uh, I've been a professor in several institutions. Um, I started out my first tenure professor position was at the University of California, Berkeley in engineering. Became a professor of engineering and medicine at the Ohio State University, where I also went to medical school. After that, I was also a professor at Wild Cornell Medical School, I was, uh, which is in New York, as you know, it has an operation that is not far from you. It's, uh, I was also a senior associate dean there. I was a professor and department chair at the cancer, MD Anderson Cancer Center, the number one cancer center in the United States, that is in Houston, Texas, where I was also a professor at the university's medical school. I had the privilege of serving as a special expert at the National Cancer Institute in the United States, where I put together the national plan on nanotechnology applied to medicine, which is still ongoing and I think despite my input has been very successful. So let me see if I can show you some few more slides here. Unfortunately, here we go. Yes, and what I do, you know, I look at life as a continuum. We cannot just be a scientist, right? You have to draw your energy from places and this is what I do. I love my music. I play the saxophone, I sing with multiple different bands, a rhythm and blues band here in Italy, where I'm speaking from right now. As well, when I'm in the United States, I play with some great musicians, such as Milton Hopkins and Texas Johnny Boy, you see them right here. I know that I'm speaking to a lot of young people. So young people do continue to pursue your passions, no matter what they are. They don't have to be super consistent with your profession, with your mission on the professional side. It's very important to keep your soul energized. Creativity has many ways to speak and they all help each other out. So that's what I do with a lot of passion. So now back to the topic I'm gonna to talk to you about, the lost in translation. Can you imagine that of the many, 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 many drugs, for instance, that are brought into existence through scientific discovery, very few, actually get to the drug development stage. And of those, the vast majorities of them die before they are turned into clinical products. It takes 10 to 17 years on average in the best places in the world to go from proven science to medical product. It costs billions of dollars because of the fact that it takes so long and it costs so much. Very, very, very few of these molecules, they have a correct science. I mean, the science is proven to work, but they never make it to the clinic. And even when they do, because of the incredibly flawed system that we have in the world for distributing drugs to people that need it, the vast majority of the people in the world never have access to these drugs. Hey, come on guys, this is not right. There is, this is an ethical necessity that we figure out a way to turn this around so that we can serve those that are in greatest needs. And I'm looking at you, we need you to figure out a way to do this because my generations has screwed it up enormously. And so we need you to pick it up and solve it. It is a huge imperative for the whole world. Now let's look at what translation really means. We are all familiar with the facts, if I can use the pointer here, very good. So here is where discovery is. You are all scientists, so you are great at doing this stuff. There are many great places that do wonderful discovery world work everywhere in the world. More and more global, of course, and the interactive global community. And for instance, we can find cures for laboratory animals, and we go through animal studies, and we prove that things work, and that gives us hope that they will also work in the similar disease for humans. And once we have this level of validation right here, we've done the preclinical work and the laboratory work, hope is great, and then you start the process of translation. 
the molecule that you studied is with graduate students and with postdocs need, needs to be manufactured in a way that is compatible with human use. You cannot give to people the molecule that you prepare for mice or rats. Manufacturing is the number one bottleneck. Manufacturing in a pharmaceutically acceptable, ethically acceptable fashion is the biggest challenge, is the reason why it takes so long and it costs so much. Pretty much all of it, most of it is right here. So I am going to be encouraging all of you to pick that challenge up and, uh, and make it your own. If you can make a difference here, you are changing the world. Just as much as, in many occasions, more than you would with the new scientific discovery. This is the bottleneck right here. Once you get that, you can do preclinical validation in the right way, you can do clinical trials, there is a big handoff after the translational phase into patient care, of course, and there all of the dynamics of the commercial world come into play, some of which are good, some of which are unacceptably bad. And from here, then you cycle back and you get new observations and you start the cycle all over again. So when I talk about translation, I will focus on from the moment when the science, we got a pretty good grip on the science. You publish it in Nature, you publish it in Science Magazine or whatever it is that you want to publish in your dream publications. From this point on to here, to get into late stage clinical trials. That's the focus of my talk. That is what I'm gonna call translation. I'll show you a few examples. That word, the translational medicine is defined, is described in multiple different places. Different definition schemes are used. I will not bore you with those. You can find them if you're interested. But I told you what I'm thinking about. GMP, GLP, phase one, and phase two. So I'm gonna tell you about the experience I've had for about 10 years in the leadership position of the Houston Methodist Hospital, where I was executive vice president. It's a system of eight hospitals, as you will see in a moment, one of the best in the United States. And I was also president and CEO of its research institute. So I started focusing on how do we solve the translational problem? That was the mission statement. So 10 years of work, these are the lessons that I've learned. You have to make your definition very stringent. What do you mean by translational research? Because if you let it loose, anything you do, everything you do in the lab is defined as translation and you lose the power of your focus. So be very stringent with your definition. Second, the best thing to do for a translational effort is to have great creative scientists that do basic fundamental science. Great, the best people you can find, but that are also thinking that they want to get their stuff to the clinic, translationally minded. Third, and perhaps most important, all of these are centrally important, but if there is one king bottleneck, is translational infrastructure, the manufacturing side, in particular the manufacturing side. Very few academic institutions have translational infrastructure. I think it is necessary to have that. It's a great opportunity for countries, for regions of the world, for communities. They want to become very prominent. They want to become leaders. You cannot do that uh, if you are not one of those already, just uh, trying to catch up with people one piece of science at a time. It doesn't work that way. If you want to bypass and get to a place of great preeminence, my recommendation is focus on translational infrastructure. Everything will come from that. You have to figure out a way, number four, to have funding to support that. They cannot come forever from a hospital or from the government or from whatever. You have to find a way to generate funds, money, out of your translational efforts. There are many ways to do this. I've pioneered a few. I've experienced several. Be happy to talk to any of you about any of the above. But it needs to be self-sustaining. Sustainability is the key word today, right? Also from the financial side of the approach to translation. And uh, number five, as important as anything else, you need to train people to do these jobs. Translational research is not like basic research. You need to develop a number of skills and you need to be able to integrate many times the basic science on the biology side with basic technology on the engineering side and physics. The world is changing. What we call drugs right now is not what we're gonna be calling drugs tomorrow. A lot more and more and more technology. That's a great opportunity for leadership. 
for regions, for countries, and for individuals, they want to take on a preeminent role in the changing world that we are experiencing today. And you see a few examples of the things that we have done. So this is the Houston Methodist cluster in the Texas Medical Center in Houston, Texas, largest medical uh, concentration in the world, and the one that I'm very honored to serve for 10 years or so. And you see some of the things that came out of that effort. You see, and again, I'm not going to have time to talk about them all, but hopefully you'll get a copy of the slides. You're, I'm going to make sure that the organization has them so that everybody can look them up and write me and ask me questions or do whatever you wish with this, I'm at your service. So you see multiple different domains of, of, of course, of impact of medical impact, pretty much all coming from the marriage of the biological sciences and the pharmaceutical sciences on one side with math and engineering and physics on the other side. That is the world. That is the world of the future they're going to be looking at, and beneficially so, I hope. So as you see, Houston Method is big institution, one of the top institutions in the United States, uh, and uh, it got ranked uh, top 10 in the United States. Uh, and then uh, in 2019, and at the time I left the organization, my leadership role there, and you feel free to think that that is why I got ranked so high after I left. <laughs> it was a big booster, of course, for the, for the hospital. Now, you see the magnitude of the research force that I had right there. That was the research institute that we built. We started from nothing. So if you have great visions for creating, of course, Arab countries have incredible skills, great resources and wonderful visions. So building something like this and much bigger is certainly within the realm of the opportunities of the things that you can do in your side of the world. And hopefully we'll be able to work together somehow. But the key to doing that is to put together the basic science, the translational infrastructure, and with the, doing that, just within a few years, we had multiple drugs in the, in, in the clinic and technologies, of course, in the clinic. And I'll give you a few examples. I will also talk about my personal science journey, not only as an executive, as an administrator. I'll show you some of the things that I brought to the clinic out of my laboratory. And this is one of the longest, uh, I think, efforts uh, that took me to get something to the clinic in this particular side here about 30 years. So, you know, it's a marathon. I come back to that, guys, it's a marathon. It's not for the faint of heart. And as you see, you have to work with many different people, many different places, and find a way to pursue your mission and your dream. And don't take no for an answer. Here we go. So here you see a few videos. They show you some of the things that we were fortunate to bring to the clinic. You will see again the integration of science and technology, biology and medicine here. Left hand side, the top, you see a new ways to do a heart surgery, replacing heart valves without having to open the chest, which is something that you cannot do many times in elderly patients. You see here, there is no surgery here. You see here the young men who used to be an athlete. These are actors that are playing out actual situations or actual patients. So you see the young man here, a former athlete that they lost control of his legs because of an accident. You see him standing up and walking. The beauty of this image is that it's controlling that motion through this uh, brain to neural interface. It's uh, essentially the cap right here, does not have electrodes piercing inside of the head, it's just collecting is EEG and picking up the order of starting and stopping the motion of this uh, robot like, uh, of course, uh, platform. New contrast agents, a lot of technology for imaging new regeneration technologies for a growing bone. So these are some of the things that also talk about where the future of the world may end up being in those specific areas. You see here just a listing of drugs and devices and the contrast agents that were in the product pipeline. I'm using the word product here. It's not only the science for the sake of science, which is the necessary fundamental, but we are talking about product center in the clinic. I show you some other little examples. This is also something that came out of my laboratory when I was at Berkeley almost 30 years ago. The, that was the beginning of the field of nanofluidics. You can use nanofluidics for delivering drugs from implants under the skin. 
you see right here this implant under the skin, this nanofluidic chip, I think was the first. This, of course, is a cartoon rendering. I'll show you the actual ones in a moment. We were the first to make nano channels, and you see them right here, using a technology that is similar to that they use for making computer chips. We take a left turn right here, and you will find a nano channel, and you see little drug molecules permeating through by diffusion. And the fact that they go through this such a narrow opening, approximately the size of the molecule themselves, gives it a new physics of transport, which was not known prior, is the principle of the hourglass at the nanometer scale. And with that, you can make devices that you can use for medical use. And I'm going to show you the work that was done by one of my former students and then, then postdocs, and then a professor at Methodist, and now the chairman of the Department of Nanomedicine, Alessandro Grattoni, he, he picked up this project and he turned it into a medical and clinical realities that you see right here on the way to that, a ways to deliver um, anti-HIV drugs, especially in parts of the world where you cannot get, uh, you can, you, you, where you can just put it under the skin and then you go, where you don't have easy access to medical facilities. This is in collaboration with Bill and Melinda Gates, with Gilead, it, in a technology to turn drugs that have a very strong side effects into drugs that are beneficial, but that limit the adverse side effects you see that right here uh, that is demonstrated in the context of drugs that address uh, metabolic syndrome. The fat mouse becomes a skinny mouse, the same mouse and diet uh, with this drug that is released at a very slow rate uh, under the skin. If you just give big injections of this drug, uh, the corresponding amount in bolus injections, the adverse effects are too big. Something else you can use for many other applications, in this case, the replacement therapy of testosterone. And this technology, you might have read about it recently because it actually ended up being featured on the International Space Station. The young man you see right here is Alessandro Grattoni, as I was talking to you about, and this gentleman right here is Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon. And it was the launch of the rocket that took this experiment on the International Space Station with a number, of, it was a set of experiments, including those that I'm not going to show you. Well, this is the, the, the movie, but you know, trust me, I want to make sure that I'm cautious about time here. But as you see right here, you might have seen it uh, because, of course, that was the Cape Canaveral with, uh, with, with the rocket came back and the first stage came back. And that was the first time in history that happened and our experiment was on the rocket and this is, no, that was a great moment. So science can be cool, it can be fun, guys. Don't let anybody tell you, ladies and gentlemen, don't let anybody tell you the science is boring. This is as exciting as anything I've ever seen. So, and that experiment also took some mice on the rocket and on the International Space Station and the results of those studies were very promising, just got published in Nature Communications. So the skinny mouse, the mouse right there, does not lose body mass, muscle mass, and uh, bone mass as much as his friends uh, remained on planet Earth. As you know, astronauts in space lose bone mass and muscle mass. But with this drug, a low concentration, long periods of time, that effect is not as pronounced, which gives hope that we can actually put people in space for a long, long time without those uh, adverse consequences. And the same technology and the same drugs are important also on planet Earth. Think of osteoporosis, think of the loss of muscle mass that is typical in advanced stages of cancer. So you don't have to be traveling through space to benefit from that. And here is, uh, and my good friend Alessandro was also able to take up uh, some extraordinary new technologies, materials for constructions in space that came from Lamborghini. So you get Ferrari talking about Lamborghini. We shouldn't do that because of course it's competition, I'm joking. All right, uh, and uh, the longest project that I've been involved with myself is that of focusing on lung and liver metastasis of cancer, no matter what the origin of this metastasis are, can be breast, can be skin, can be from other parts in the body. Once uh, the cancer gets to lungs and liver, typically the prognosis is very grim. We don't have cures for that uh, type of diseases, uh, metastatic disease to lungs and liver. And that is the number one cause of death due to cancer in the world. So it's, 
we started focusing on that. And the path that I took over the last 30 years allowed us to establish a number of platform technologies and to start certain fields of science that I will mention in a moment. And it was the marathon that I wanted to talk to you about. You know, it's, you're gonna be, if you want to make a big difference, there is no two ways about it. You have to figure out a way to uh, survive the bad moments. There is gonna be many of those bad moments. My wife has told me that, uh, that, that the samurai, the fighting heroes of Japan, of course, history, samurai have an expression, they say, seven times down, eight times up. That is the key to success if you are a scientist. I'm not, a, I don't consider myself a successful scientist, but those that have been successful, they all share that particular hallmark. So one thing that we discovered during the years is that uh, biological barriers, the body set up different compartments in the body have different barriers that are very intelligent. They know what can penetrate and what cannot penetrate at what rate and under what circumstances. And those dominate what happens to the drugs that you give to people, much more so than specificity. Specificity is the final event of a long chain. Biological barrier penetration is the dominant event that gives you in first order biodistribution, but then of course it also gives you efficacy and it gives you toxicity. If the penetration is not of the type you want, you have here a list of barriers. So we focus on biological barriers and try to modulate those and build the drugs. I'm using build drugs, you will see why in a moment, so that they can make it across those barriers in preferential fashions and concentrate on cancer sites. And this is the slide I showed you earlier. By looking at barriers with a number of different platform technologies, we started in many ways the field of nanomedicine the field of transport oncophysics, the field of multi-stage vectors, and this new generation that came after about 25 years that we call injectable nanoparticle generators or IMPGs. We also call them transtherapeutics sometimes, but the word is also used with a different meaning, meaning, so I'm moving away from that. You see some of the key moments in that, I will go through them. So I had the privilege of being perhaps the first to, to write about cancer and nanotechnology in the same sentence in a major journal. At the end, when I was putting it together at the National Cancer Institute, I was invited to write that. Much to my surprise, he made the cover of Nature Reviews, cancer. I left the NCI, went back to private life. As an academic, I set up a number of centers with multiple institutions, putting together technology, biology, and of course, we're a clinical soul. And you see some of them summarized right here. Then it turns out that we, we, we understood through that experience of nanotechnology and cancer, the biological barriers were so important and transport was so important. So we coined the expression transport oncophysics. And that gave rise to this article that you saw also uh, come up in the, on the cover of Nature Reviews Cancer. And based on that, in transport oncophysics, we established national centers with collaborators, some of which you see here listed, and uh, um, not only for uh, transport of drugs, but as we'll see in a moment, also for transport of, of course, nanoparticles, but also for cell therapeutics and immunotherapy. I'll come to that in a moment. But through those studies of transport, this is essentially physics, math, together with biology, nanotechnology, we were able to identify some of the determinants that tell you from the physics side where your particles are going to go once you inject them in systemic circulation. Changing size and shape and charge and things such as that, you can concentrate particles in the lung or in the liver and the spleen without the need for biological recognition. This is physics-based targeting. I'm not gonna go into too much detail for obvious reasons, but you know, this is all published and I'd be happy to talk to you about all of the above. We found that the nanoparticles, no matter what nanoparticles it is, no matter how they are loaded, no matter what drug, no matter if they are biologically targeted or not, they could not cure metastatic disease to lungs and liver. That's my objective. So we had to come with next generation technology. So we did this multi-stage, which is essentially a microparticle that delivers a nanoparticle that delivers a drug or for the revolution of that. And you see them right here, I made the cover of Nature Nanotech in 2008. 
any number of other stories. I'm just going to show you nature articles. Uh, but there is, uh, we have hundreds of publications on this, as you can imagine. We're able to find ways to add biological targeting so that we could address, uh, for instance, uh, malignancies uh, that are associated with the bone marrow as a metastatic niche and as an origin of uh, liquid cancers. And also doing the same from contrast agents, um, and uh, we don't have time to discuss all of those, and find ways to get, again, to treat uh, bone metastasis, in this case of, of metastatic breast cancer right here, with biological targeting as well, to target inflamed vascular endothelium associated with tumor angiogenesis. This got a lot of attention. We delivered this uh, SIRNA, and this was covered in Nature in 2014. And uh, that was a way to essentially prove that a certain uh, stress protein, ER stress protein, was uh, foundational for, uh, for, for a set of the breast cancers that we call generically triple negative. So this is a basic biology done in vivo using nanoparticles as an SIRNA platforms for validation. I promise to you applications to the world of immunotherapy. You see Haifa Shen here, my longtime collaborator, a tremendous scientist, great. And we developed ways to understand how why certain cancers respond better than others to, uh, to, uh, to immune approaches, immunotherapy, and use those discoveries to develop new ways of vaccinating for therapeutic as well as for preventative purposes, animals that have this uh, form of breast cancer that is the equivalent of R2 positive breast cancer. So that came out in Cell Report 2015. And based on that, we established another national center for immunotherapeutic transport oncophysics that is still ongoing. And then again, I'm just gonna show you some of the key people here. A lot of that has to do with leading clinicians in immunotherapy, like Dr. Mittendorf, who is now at Dana Farber. Basic biology and immunology, but a lot of math, a lot of physics, and they have to be integrated with one another. That is the key to success. So out of that experience, uh, uh, one in particular that I want to talk to you about is, as I was telling you, the IMPGs, injectable nanoparticle generators. Remember, the multi-stage vectors are microparticles that deliver nanoparticles that deliver drugs. That doesn't work to cure metastatic disease either. It does many other good things, but not metastatic disease to the lungs. Because, as we found out, uh, the microparticles uh, concentrate on blood vessel walls that feed the tumors, the metastatic tumors in the lungs in particular. That's great. But then the nanoparticles don't enter into the cancer tissue. They are stuck at the blood vessel wall. So we had to figure out a way to make a cross the blood vessel wall. And this is the way we came up uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, so essentially inside of the silicon particles right here, biodegradable silicon microparticle nanoporous, we have these strands of polymers that have a drug, uh, the cytotoxic payload, connected to it through a pH-sensitive linker. The advantage of this formulation, they are not nanoparticles, so they can permeate inside of the tumor, and then inside of the tumor, they form nanoparticles of a type that gets picked up by the cells that are particularly important for metastatic cancer. We are calling those cells, uh, the, the, like everybody else does, uh, tumor therapy resistant cells, so tumor initiating cells are called sometimes uh, cancer stem cells by others. Those are the ones that are very difficult to kill with chemotherapy. And even after the vast majority of the cancer is wiped out, they're repopulated, and that's why we lose patients uh, to, to what we call therapeutic resistance. So what you see right here is that with this approach, actually we got animals in the lab to be completely cured of their metastatic disease to lungs and liver. About 40 to 50% of them, multiple different models. We published that in Nature Biotech. The key again is that nanoparticles are generated inside. We have uh, had a patent pending on that notion for a number of years. And you guys brought me great luck because today I learned that that patent got approved 
by the United States uh, PTO, a patent and trademark office. So it is now officially patented, which hopefully will help us bring it to the clinic in a more efficient and efficacious fashion. You see right here, that was the original paper in Nature Biotech again with Haifa. Many stories I can tell you about that, but we're not gonna have time, but please contact me. The mechanism of action of those drug, of the drug is, uh, which is important, is what you have to declare to the regulatory body and prove to the regulatory body, is a transport based. So this is a, div a variation with respect to what you normally see in the pharmaceutical world, I think is a very fundamental transformation. This is a physics based mechanism of action, which is summarized in this cartoon. It's a bit too long to feel free to read the paper and call me up and ask me questions, but essentially different parts of the drug. You remember we got four pieces to the drug. We got the silicon, we got the polymer, we got the pH sensitive linker, and we got the drug. Each does a part of the journey across multiple different biological barriers. And that is how you can get the killer drug to the nucleus, which is where it acts. If you take away any of the pieces of this complicated drug, it does not work and nothing else does to cure metastatic disease. So we are putting a lot of hope into this drug. And so that mechanism that I just showed you, that we postulated based on math. And then we validated it in Nature Biotech in 2016, just by showing that we would cure those animals, 40 to 50% complete cure. They go on to live without cancer for the rest of their lives and they live as long as their healthy litter mates that never had cancer to start with. So that's a functional cure. So this is the mechanism. It took four years to publish the imaging validation of the study. So it was conceived mathematically, and now you see here, just got published last week. In the current issue of Science Advances, you will find the image validation of that uh, done by a wonderful young lady by the name of Shreya Goel. And Shreya is, uh, is, is now at MD Anderson, and that was her postdoctoral project, and she's done a fantastic job. Essentially, what you see right here is that without the need for any targeting biological agent, I get a ton of drug in the lungs, in the lung metastasis in particular, but if the animal is healthy, there is nothing in the lungs. A lot in the lungs with metastatic disease, and that's why we can cure those lungs. And you can prove that with imaging at all level, at the body level, at the tissue level, and in between, chronically in the entire journey. So what we got right now is, uh, is, uh, uh, we, are, we have the ability now to take it out. We have done the science. Remember what I started with? 10 to 17 years. From the moment your science is set up, you need manufacturing. You need, of course, the intellectual property protection to be able to attract the funds so that you can then do, bring it to the clinic and then distribute it any which way that you want. You can distribute it not for profit, which is what my objective is or you can distribute it in other ways. But you know, the, the, the time of development is, uh, is immense. Uh, and from science to transition to the clinic, we want to shorten the 10 to 17 years. So the way to do that, uh, we decided to establish a company. That's one of the companies that, uh, that I told you about that I've been associated with. Briette brings this particular IMPG product with uh, Dr. Rubicin, we call it IMPG PDOCs also known as ML16. And what I'm gonna show you from this point on has to do with the clinical translation that we are doing right now. So you see the summary of what are the advantages and what are the characteristics of this, uh, of this approach. And it is a new chemical entity. It's not the drug delivery system. It's a new chemical entity. And it accumulates in the tumor because of its physical properties, is physics-based targeting. It creates nanoparticles for the first time that we know of inside of the tumor. And because of those nanoparticles that are what we call exosome-like, because of the nature that is so similar to exosomes, that's how they get picked up preferentially by the cancer stem cells, and they actually end up doing the job that they need to do. So that's where we are right now. As you see, you see the summaries so of some of the things that I've talked to you about. The key component is that we get effective attack of cancer stem cells. That's how 
you can prevent the recurrence of the disease and the onset of what we call therapeutic resistance. Now, let me come back to a notion that I said earlier on, what is the key to successful, you need, there's multiple necessary steps, but of those, um, the one that perhaps I believe is the most daunting, is the place where most products never make it to the clinic, even though they would help people even though they would be better than current drugs, even though they could cure currently incurable diseases. The most daunting barrier of them all is production, is manufacturing. This is a new class of therapeutic agent you have to invent the way you manufacture them in a way that is regulatorily approvable. So you need to develop new manufacturing strategies. You need to work with the regulatory body to make sure that they understand how it works and they can validate it and they can be in their conscience satisfied that what you're coming up with is what your theory said. And it's gonna be the same every time you make the drug. Extremely complicated. This snapshot I'm showing you, remember this drug has got four components. It's got silicon, it's got polymers. These are things that usually we don't see in normal drug formulations. These are in particular in the format of nanoparticles that are formed inside of the body. Certainly not in the format of microparticles that are biodegradable and disintegrating the body, but the notion of injecting nanoporous silicon microparticles in the body is a notion that is very different from what the pharmaceutical industry has done so far. So you see the environment where these things are made is a space age, is a space age, bio, pharma. It's a new generation. That's the new frontier that many of you are going to be working with. I don't mean to say in my technologies, but in the technologies that are arising all over the world that are pointing into the same direction. It's a new world. So, and manufacturing is the key. Whoever controls the manufacturing game is going to have the control over the future. Very important to keep in mind. So that brings me to my conclusions. My conclusions are in three key messages. Key message number one is the summary of the barriers and the potential ways to address these barriers in a translational medicine approach. Be very strict in what you call translational, bring in very creative scientists, the best scientists you can find that have a translational mind. Some do, some don't. More don't than do. So that's how you make your choices. Infrastructure, manufacturing in particular, paramount importance and a great opportunity sustainable funding approach, sustainable approach to translation through, of course, generating wealth to those that give you wealth to make these things happen and educational programs that are focused on this. So this is my number one message in terms of the strategy, take home message. Second is the marathon. I actually started running marathons because they are so much easier than a day at the office. And I started running marathons in my 50s. I now run maybe 50 marathons or so, 40, 50. Of the 40 kilometer, 42 kilometer times, I've also ran 100 kilometer marathons. And trust me, what you have to prepare yourselves for, if you want to bring the product of your science into the clinic, it's much, much harder than a 100 kilometer running marathon. And all you gotta do is left, right, left, right with your feet. So get ready, it's all in your head, like for the running, it's all in your head, it's all in your heart, it's all in why you do what you do. My objective in life is to find ways to, to be of service to people that, that, that need the things that we can bring. So that allows you to get up eight times after the seven knockdowns that I was telling you about that my wife has taught me. Third, a great president of the United States once said, a secret of success is to surround yourself with great people and get out of the way. In my case, I've been very blessed with the opportunity to work with many young men and women from all sorts of different places in the world, including your side of the world. And, uh, and they are the ones, they are the true heroes of, this, of, this, of the stories that I've been telling you. So in my case, I try to bring them in and get out of the way. And many of the things that now you see that I talked about as if I had done it all. Trust me, it was them that done it pretty much all. And my job was just to give them the opportunities to express their greatness. So those are the three closing messages. 
and uh, I'd be very happy to, uh, to continue to interact with all of you. We are not sure that I'm going to be able to, to connect by video and take a Q&A. So I'm taking a couple of extra seconds right here to make sure that you all have my email addresses. Feel free to contact me, I really mean it. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, uh, in case, of course, that, uh, that um, live connection does not work, uh, what you will have seen is a recorded uh, message done uh, here from Italy where I find myself right now. So I wish you the best. It's been a honor and a delight uh, to have the ability to address all of you. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to hear from you in the future. Take care. Bye.